Shalom, and welcome to another edition of Parsha Talk. I'm Rabbi Elliot Malman in Highland Park, New Jersey, the Highland Park Conservative Temple Congregation on Che Emmet. And joining me to, as usual, my good friends, Rabbi Jeremy Kalmanovsky, Anshay Chesson in New York. Hello, Jeremy. And Rabbi Barry Chesler, Solomon Schechter, Day School of Long Island. Barry, great to see you. Chag HaTzmaut Sameach, Happy Yom HaTzmaut. Today we are recording on Yom HaTzmaut. 73rd anniversary of the State of Israel. We'll talk about that in uh, a moment through our, our time together. But first, we got to talk about our amazing Parsha. We have an amazing double Parsha, Tazriya Mitzora. I have to say, many of you, of course, love hearing that I have. Every week we say it's an amazing Parsha. And I thought, how are we going to say it's an amazing Parsha this week? Uh, but every Parsha has within it essential truths. And, and I think that that is true from Tazriya Mitzora, even if the subject material is somewhat distant for us. Well, let's start with the beginning. The beginning, Tazriya, is about childbirth. Of course, three men in a Zoom, are, is, three men are not really going to know much about childbirth except vicariously. Uh, but, I've been but, present. I've been present four times. Okay, I've been as, as was I. <laughs> we, we each we each we each of us have four kids. We've each been present four times as spectators, admittedly. <laughs> okay. And no, I, I just want to say, Elliot. But I, gonna, I completely... well, we did as much as we could do. <laughs> yeah, but that was beforehand. But, uh... <laughs> but okay. Uh, but Elliot, I want to I want to totally agree with you that. Um, you know, like I usually say to bar mitzvah kids, this is the one you feel bad for. Is not is not for you know rabbis who love to study Torah and even the even the hard parts you, they're they're fruitful. It's 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 rough on the bar mitzvah kids, man, to have to sure, come up with sure. a dvar Torah. But my, my bar mitzvah kid this week has a very nice dvar Torah. Yedidya Kalmanovsky was his tutor, so he had a he had a leg up. But um, but the uh, I always say to the kids, you know, everything in the Torah is meaningful. But sometimes that's a little closer to the surface, and sometimes you have to dig a little harder to find it to find it meaningful. I always use this parsha to have a scholar in residence. <laughs> okay, the woman, the childbearing woman, and what happens after eight days later if she has a boy? If she has a boy, the Torah tells us the boy is going to have the brit milah, isha kitazria. Okay, and then. Uh, it says, Uviyom Hashmini, Yimo Basar Arlato, Arlato, circumcision, important concept. The single most, I guess, powerful ritual in Judaism as it, as it is on the flesh. Um, and I, what, what can we say about Brit Mila, Rabbi Kamalaski? Well, there's a, there's a lot to say about Brit Mila. Uh, you know, Spinoza had nothing good to say about Judaism. He thought it was ridiculous, and and uh, you know, he as much as uh, you know, he was he was excommunicated when he was in his early twenties because of his her heresy, and he didn't he didn't look back. But he did write that circumcision is so powerful; uh, it is such a binding. You know, it's it's tribal in the in the good sense of the term that he thought that circumcision alone would help the Jewish people endure and maybe even restore, uh, restore to its uh, you know, bygone glory. Um, I, this is a very heady religion, a lot of ideas, uh, a lot of concepts, a lot of, a lot of talking, a lot of study. And I appreciate you know, among, among the elements that are, um, that are uh, you know, powerful in, in this, is, this is inscribed on the male body, it's on the body. Paul, Rabbi Shaul Mitarshish, back back that that ancient heretical Jew, Paul of Tarsus, Saint Paul said, "Listen, it's it's not about the body. It's things of the spirit are more important than things of the body. Things that mark off Jews from other people. That's not good. Um, it, there's no there's no there's no Jew nor Gentile. There's no there's no Jew nor Greek. There's no male nor female in, in Christ. Um, but." Jews have always said, no, 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 it's not that way. There is a family, there is a bond, there is a flesh, there is a body, those things matter. I can't uh, deny, you know, fe feminist, feminist readers will note that like, this is inscribed on the male body and there can't really be anything analogous, uh, which is certainly true. 
uh, but that said, I think that the inscription of the of the the membership in Am Yisrael in the body um, is is just it's inestimably important. Yeah, we we I, 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 I would go. Go ahead. Man. I'd like to suggest go just a step further than than Jeremy is that what's important is the human body, and. What makes it important is that that's how we distinguish ourselves from God. In the Yigdal, which we all know, God has no body. That is a later development in Judaism, perhaps. Um, ben Summers wrote a book about the bodies of God in the Bible, which was quite fascinating. But circumcision emphasizes the male body, as childbirth emphasizes the female body. And What's important for us as Jews is that we are grounded, both literally and figuratively, in our bodies. We don't separate ourselves from our bodies. Our bodies are very, very much a part of our identity, both as individual human beings, but also as a nation as well. Well, that's a good segue into, into the content of the Parsha, because the, the content of the Parsha is, is deeply concerned about the body, and specifically bodily disfigurement, eruptions on the skin, emissions from the body, and, and what happens to the body. We'll take the first couple of verses from, from chapter 13. When a person has on the skin of his body a swelling, a rash, a discoloration, and develops into a scaly affection in the skin of the body. In other words, there are symptoms. There's a whole symptomology that is being presented here what is this person going to do? There is no medical profession. There's no, you know, no, no doctor to go to. Who, do you, who, you, who are you going to call? You're going you're gonna to go to the Kohen. The Kohen is the one that is going to uh, administer whatever it is that the Kohen could administer. The person goes to Aaron or to one of his sons. In other words, he's got to go to, to a person. And that, I think there's some significance there. The significance is there, you know, when you are afflicted, you don't know what to do. And, and affliction is on the body uh, which, in which we live, um, especially on the skin, is going to have a terrible, terrible set of ramifications for us. We live, we live yeah. in our bodies, we live with our skin. Yeah. And, and the bodies, and one can only, think that especially for you know ancient people who didn't have nearly the empirical knowledge I mean they, of course they, they, they were human beings they lived so they had a, a sense of plenty of empirical knowledge but they didn't have the kind of you know scientific or anatomical knowledge that we have or biological knowledge that we have um, the the sense of disorder and the need to to manage such that one has a feeling of order is just so super duper important um, and so when you have these illnesses, whether that's, it, it, it's, it, you know, whether, whether tzara'at, nega tzara'at, the, the skin affliction, it, it's not presumably what the, the contemporary, you know, disease called Hansen's disease or, or you know, we call leprosy, but it's some sort of oozing, discharge, whatever. It's all about disorder. Uh, the stuff that is inside, oh, is breaking up and, and, and coming outside now. And the, and the outside, which is the barrier, which keeps you, um, you know, keeps all the outside stuff out there and, and holds your body together. Ooh, that's breaking. And, and what do we do? And, and how do we have a sense that we're not terrified? How do we have a sense of order? And the part is going to end up with, you know, sex organs emissions, both, both um, normal, like, like semen and menstruation, and then abnormal things that are like diseases. So it's, it's so fascinating. I think, I think that that's really the critical theme here. Disease is, a, is, is experienced as an experience of, of disorder, experience of chaos. That is, chaos is entering well, that, the world of order. Right. That's why the ritual is so important, because ritual is the creation of human order on top of the chaos. Right. And so and we take this chaotic situation, and the, the solution, as it were, for the disease it's highly ritualized. The Kohen is going to visit a couple times. There's going to be an elaborate sacrificial rite at the end. And it's a way of trying to make take control of the situation and make it bearable. Right. And, and if you just, you know, we're just going to dip into 
a little bit of, of, of medicine. I, I'm reading a book now by Bill Bryson, The Body. Bill Bryson, A Walk in the Woods, one of the, is a really fantastic writer. And, and in the book, he's talking about all, all the things that could go wrong, the, the thousands of different kinds of diseases. We are, we are, he wrote, he published it right before COVID, you know, and, and, and he's talking about all the different kinds of epidemics that possibly can happen. And of course, you know, a year after he published it, you know, we're, we're in the middle of this one. But the point is that we, we are encountering forces of disorder and, and to our ancestors living in the world in which all forces were, were uh, you know, properly deified, you know, the idea of having one God and having uh, one source of order and things going wrong, I think is highly problematic. And that's exactly where ritual turns in. So let's, let's talk about that for a second. Because the 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 mitzora, this the, the the specifically the person afflicted with the skin ailment, has an elaborate ritual that he experiences. Uh, that individual, male or female, has to be outside the camp seven days, and then uh, the coin visits, and then and then uh, another seven days of sequestration, and it's only after a period of fourteen days, which is so fascinating. You know, we, we also have a 14 day period of quarantine. After 14 days, this individual has to present before the Kohen, has to offer certain sacrifices. Uh, and the sacrifice includes uh, two birds. One, the, one bird is slaughtered over a, 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 an earthenware uh, cup or something, a, a vessel that holds water. The, the blood of the bird goes into the the, the water, and then the, the Kohen takes the live bird, dips it into the, the bloody water mixture, and then sends off the bird. And we were talking before, you know, recording about the idea that, that a certain kind of magic is, is trying to break in here. I mean, it's obvious. Yes, it's trying to break in here, except, you know, nothing in the text is, leads you to anything magical. It's really trying to define it, but that's what's all around. The people I think, I, yeah, I feel like, I feel like the, um, you know, whether, whether it's magical, I mean, I, I, I don't feel really capable of answering that, but what I do feel is that it's incredibly poetic. And the thought that you take the, um, you take the bread, you take the, the bird and you, um, I guess you collect its blood in the earthenware vessel with with Mayim Chaim, means like spring water, spring water. okay? So you, you're at a spring. Um, it, it, can't mean, it can't mean fresh water as opposed to salty water. It's got to mean fresh water like flowing spring. And then you dip another bird's foot or dip the bird itself, or maybe it's just the, I don't know. I don't know what it means to dip the bird, the living bird in the blood of the dead bird. But you dip the, whether it's the whole body or the feet or whatever it is, I don't know. And then, and then the bird flies away. So it's hard for me to not think, you know, that whether, whether the idea is that it carries away the disease in a magical way or simply in a poetic way, you came in contact with death symbolized by the blood. The death is overcome by life symbolized by the Mayim Chayim, the, the fresh flowing spring water and the bird which flies away. Yeah. I just think that it's, it's like, it's you know it's it's like it's like the fact in Hebrew um, that the word dror means both freedom and it's the name of the bird like the sparrow or whatever it is like freedom this this bird can fly away and that's just so poetic. It's reaching for the symbolism of of trying to take away that which is which is afflicted the person. Give it one more second, which is which is that the in the slaughter in the in the sacrifice the ritual of putting blood on the ear the the thumb and the big toe and then he, 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 the kohen takes some oil and mixes it and also puts it on the on the ear on the toe and on the on the thumb and and here you know that will remind us of the rituals that were involved with consecrating Aaron and the and, and the sons of Aaron in a sense. What the what this person experiences is the the elevation and the and the consecration again. So so I want to offer you this this idea, which is 
you take the person that has been physically wounded by disease, psychologically and spiritually wounded by their sequestration and quarantine, and you are enabling them to re-enter into the society and you're giving him or her the symbols of consecration of the priesthood in saying, you are now part of this holy people again. I find it fascinating. And I've never really looked at the rituals as deeply. And I think the idea, and we'll talk about it, the idea of a ritual of re-entry is just so powerful. It's so powerful when you think about it, for example, we we're talking about the person coming up from, from Shiva. The person after sitting seven days has to re-enter society. And that barrier between the sequestration from society and being in your home to being back into your normal life is a very, very difficult boundary. You know, there's literature on incarceration, people who leave prison and, and without having a ritual, they don't do very well. Watch the Shawshank Redemption and see how many of those people, you know, commit suicide in the movie because they can't handle, there, there's no ritual that welcomes them. There's no, there's no embrace. And, and so the, the theory that I have is that we are in the moment of various points of re-entry into society from, from people who are, you know, experiencing the, the, the pandemic on, on various levels. And, and I think we're in for something. Go ahead, Ben. So what I wanted to add here is that when we think of ourselves as being sick, we're being constrained. We cannot do what we wish to do. We are tied up as it were. And when you were talking about the bird flying away, that bird represents the breaking of constraints. That's what the re-entry into the community is. Um, to remind ourselves about Shawshank Redemption, the people, some of the people who left didn't want to leave. It wasn't just a matter of ritual, is that they had been denied their freedom for so long, they can no longer see themselves as even possibly being free. Yeah. And so the freedom became oppressive. Yeah. For us, the freedom is liberating. Right. Um, and but 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 the, the just, point is the point is on. with in the absence of a ritual in the absence of a ritual that receives that former convict or in the absence of a ritual that 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 fully embraces the 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 mourner or let me add in the absence of a full ritual that fully embraces the person returning to shul for the first time after a year of absence or a year of not having that experience in the in the in the in the real setting, the virtual yes, but in the in the setting of real bodies, that's very powerful. I think you know we. You There's know, no the question. Aliyah, that it's the powerful. Aliyah to the Torah comes close. Okay, the Aliyah to the Torah is a kind of moment of recognition. Yes, I have I have a space in front of the community. You, you know what? You know what? Another one that's not. You know, we talked we before we started recording, and then throughout this conversation, we've been talking about the. The ways these things work. I mean, rite of passage is just hugely important in religion. Um, the the anthropologist Arnold von Gainer, who coined the term, you know, talks about how you how it breaks how how life you know breaks apart and comes back together. And these rites of passage take people on that journey from from the the bygone identity to the new identity. I'm thinking about. Um, I'm sure Elliot has as well, and in, in your own life. Um, you help people have divorces, right? And a get. And when a woman receives a get, customarily she takes takes the thing, takes the document, lifts it up, and walks four paces. And that walk, the and I and I and I usually will say to somebody as she receives the get, you know, like, you know, you 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 we walk from the difficult passage we've been into your new life, and you know, if you, if you can help people have that, of course, it's, it's it, you know, often by the time I get to do a get, they, the civil divorces, you know, they, the couple has been apart for a long time and civil divorce has passed, but um, to try to give people that sense that they're, that, they're, that they're passing from one part of life to another. I want to point out, by the way, the great, the great Yiddish writer, Chaim Grada, happens to be buried in the Anshin Chesed Cemetery. And, um, and so, uh, you know, when I go, I, I visit, I say hello. And, um, and on his grave, Grada wasn't in the camps. He actually escaped, uh, I think, into Soviet Russia uh, from the Nazis, but he certainly was a Vilna, a Vilna Jew, Chaim Vilner. 
And on his grave, it says, Ha'am ha'ochim ba'choshech ra'u or gadol. Yoshbei be'eret salmavet or naga alehim. The people who walked in darkness have come to see a great light. And those who, those who dwelt in the desert land, the, the light has dawned upon them. And I don't know exactly what was on his mind. There's a big, there's a big long Yiddish thing on his grave, which I'm incapable of reading. But um, I just, I have to think that he's, that he's referring to, you know, the, the escape from the, this, um, uh, you know, terrible, terrible imprisonment. And, and the, the Orgadol becomes a kind of liberation. And I think that the experience of the Mitzorah, especially, by the way, in the Haftarah this week about the four Mitzorahim, the, these, four, these four, four guys who are banished outside the city gate of Shomron um, because they are lepers and they're Mitzorahim, they have Negat Sarat. You know, we don't know, I don't know, like, how long is that term? Well, let's say they're not healed. You know, they, they, you said they're quarantined for 14 days. When they get healed, how about when they not get healed? They could be there for years. It could be just absolutely awful. And uh, and in that story, when they turn out to be the heroes, it is like they've been they've been walking in the dark. Or gadol, the tremendous light that they experience. So so Grada is a useful a useful figure for us to pivot to to. I mean, it, it works out this way. It just it just happens today. Yom Atzmud this week, the Aseret Yemei Hoda'a, the 10 days of, of gratitude, as it is now being known in Israel, from Yom HaShoah all the way through Yom HaZikaron, which was yesterday, and now today, Yom HaTzmud. And, and does this theme of re-entry apply to, to Israel? Does it apply to the Jewish people? And in light of what you said about Grada, Ha'ochim B'choshech, Ha'ochim yeah, Ha'am Ba'choshech Ra'u Or Gadol. It's Isaiah chapter nine. Ra'u Or Gadol. Okay, so can we go with this for a moment? Is is does Israel represent uh, the reentry of the Jewish people onto the stage of world history, and and what are the ramifications of that? Little theme. <laughs> well, the ramifications we can't unpack. Immediately, I think they're still in the process of being unpacked. That will take probably at least another generation. But I think that the Zionist enterprise was a reorientation of the Jews' place in the world. And the question for us as three rabbis living in Galut, though with strong attachments, both physical and spiritual, to the land of Israel, is what do we and personal is what do we make of the state of Israel. There is a tendency for Yom Asma'u to be an Israeli holiday in the Galut. A lot of Israelis celebrate it. Um, and the question is, for us, is what is its religious significance as diaspora Jews that we want to celebrate this, this great day? So in my school, for example, following the Minha Conservativi, you know, we have the Torah reading for Yom Mood and the Haftarah, which is not normally done on a weekday. We recited the full Hallel yes. and um, included the al that's in the, um, in, the, in the Sim Shalom. And that speaks to us in a certain way. We link with the prayer of the al the state of Israel, to the Purim story and the Hanukkah story. Um, we link it to our spiritual nourishment by having a special Torah reading in the Haftarah. And the Haftarah is a repeat of the one we recited on the last day of Pesach, one of the great Haftarot. And um, we're still trying to figure out who we are. And the I, last point I would add here is Jeremy had mentioned something before, I think we were recording that um, right around now, in 2021, Israel may actually be the largest Jewish community in the world, not only in numbers, but in percentage as well. So that over half the Jews of the world probably now live in the state of Israel. And that also will be a reorientation because those of us who have grown up until now, reaching back into the 60s and 50s of the previous century, 
have been accustomed to thinking our, of ourselves as the largest and most important Jewish community, and the numbers no longer support that. Right. So we, we you know, we are in a moment of real transition in, in Jewish history uh, and, and in terms of Israel. And of course, you know, you spoke to the, the idea of the ritualization of Yom HaAtzma'ut, and, and I think all of our synagogues, you know, do those uh, rituals on some level. We all read Allel and the, and the Torah reading uh, and the Haft Torah reading. The point is, though, that that, that reaches, uh, you know, a, a minuscule proportion of our, of our you know, relative memberships. And, and the extent to which the narrative of Israel plays itself out in the lives of our community, I think is, is, is really a question. I mean, it's something that I think the three of us are really devoted to, uh, I, you know, constantly talking about Israel, constantly teaching Israeli culture. I wish that we, we had more Hebrew speaking um, in, in America, that's, a, that's a, another topic for another time, but it's, it's central to the whole idea of, you know, how do you be a people today without the shared language? Um, and it's never been easier also. And, and of course, everybody watches Fauda and Stissel and, and, and other, you know, amazing productions. Um, Jeremy, how are you weighing in on, on this? And, yeah, and, it's, and, it's, it's uh, tremendously complicated. I mean, listen, I'm, I'm a, <laughs> The guy on my shoulder, he says, you're always a yes, but Zionist. And, and I, don't, I don't want to be a yes, but Zionist. I want to be a, a, a total, you know, I, I, think, I think Israel is a great miracle. I think the kibbutz galuyot, the gathering of the exiles, literally from every country on earth. It's an amazing um, thing. Amazing thing. It's totally miraculous. And, and as Ben-Gurion said, if a Jew doesn't believe in miracles, they're not a realist. And... Uh, and you got to feel that, that the things that we have seen in our own lifetimes are just totally mind blowing and deserve celebration. And if you don't see those things as miraculous, then, then I, I I don't have a concept that a miracle has to be the Red Sea or a miracle has to be you know an utterly supernatural thing. I think that these that these things that we have witnessed in our own lifetimes or you know our parents' lifetimes are just just wonderful and miraculous. And um, I, I also think that that the that the critics of Zionism um, uh, have a point. Uh, I mean, both the Haredi and the left-leaning critics of Zionism have a point, which is that the mingling of political power and religious meaning can be an unholy alliance. Right? Um, the identification of you know uh, of of the religious meaning of the divine sort of providential, the destiny of Am Yisrael, all of which totally captures my heart and, and are the things that are integral to my religious connection to the state of Israel, are also run up against the fact that, that Israel is a country like all other countries and the prime minister is on trial for, for corruption and the previous prime minister went to jail for corruption and the president of Israel went to jail for rape and all. Like, this is a country that's got plenty of corruption, got plenty of stupidity, got plenty of mistakes and has a very serious conflict with, with its neighbors. And so I want to, like, I'm, I'm against, I mean, I, I don't want to say too much of this, but I don't really like that that singing of the Havienu L'Shalom Me'avakan to Hatikva. I think that's a, I think that's a, an overmuch mingling Politics. So one of the Let's teachers at my school positively despises it. You know, she's a Chiloni Israeli. But one of the other Israeli teachers doesn't, it doesn't bother him, which I think speaks to the Kibbutz Galiot, that they're Jews from all over the world and all over the spectrums of religiosity and nationalism and spirituality. And I, you know, thinking again for a moment, sorry to interrupt, Jeremy, is that if we would go to Israel, we would be outsiders. We would not be immediately absorbed into the country. And I think that's something that bothers a lot of Americans who think about Aliyah and choose not to go, because no one wants to be an outsider. And, you know, the question is, how does Israel absorb these other people? Well, and I, the last I, thing I would say in this regard is that there is one important let me just say one last thing, that sure. there is one important difference that makes Israel unique, and that is, it is a Jewish state. We are like other people in terms of corruption and 
politics that don't always speak to the people, but it is the only place where Jews are in control and have their destiny in their hands. And this is the laboratory for seeing what kind of place Judaism was supposed to thrive in. I agree with everything. And, and, and even the Bahavienu, although, although for different reasons, because we, we just need new tunes, I think. It's just, you know, maybe not. I, mean, I also don't like Arab Shoshanim to the Kedusha, but that's for, for different reasons. But, but look, uh, Zionism was a revolution for Judaism. Zionism was a revolution for, for, for Jewish ideas. It, it, it was uh, unabashed in creating a new kind of Jew. Uh, and the celebration of, of Israel, I think the combination of the Zionist dream uh, is, is truly about the creation of a new Jew. We, we, are, we, we are not as attentive to that reality as we, we ought to be. That, that, that Zionism makes demands on us, specifically the demand of, of how to live now as a diaspora Jew uh, when, when there's Jewish sovereignty and what that means and how each and every one of our lives has been, I think, inextricably altered by the existence of the state of Israel, whether it's in something as banal as chumas or as something as, you know, the, the very question of how we're going to live out our lives. I think that this is, this is there. And, and on the question of, you know, are we going to be an outsider? You know, you guys haven't lived as outsiders. You know, we, we all, we, it's part of the, the experience on some level of being a Jew everywhere. Maybe, I mean, do you not, I mean, are you so at home in America that you feel that you are not an outsider here? I, I, uh, I, think, I think you are right. And we do feel some, some alienation, although this is my birthplace. It's my, it's my mother tongue. Um, and I have, I, I think Barry's right. You know, we, we sense, I mean, even, even the, the three of us have been to Israel a million times and, and speak Hebrew well, and we're, we're part of it. Elliot, I mean, your kids may, may, you know, at this point feel feel somewhat different, but I am acutely aware that I that when I'm in there, I am a a loving cousin and not a native, you know. Yes. Um, and and it makes by the way, it gives me massive, massive uh, admiration for all of our ancestors who left Eastern Europe and came to to North America and. Because that was an that was like a that was really taka an immigration that was a transformative thing. Um, I would love this conversation. I want to continue. I, I have a program that's beginning right got now, right. and I just got so, a text asking me where I am. So got I'm going to cut out. We're, we're going to we're going to end up here. Just want to say, oh, so much to talk about. Thank you so much for joining us. We love your comments. We love everything. Happy happy Chagat Smaut. Chagat Smaut. Good Shabbos to everyone. We'll see you all next week. Another edition of Parsha Talk.